I want to welcome you all to this afternoon's talk on addressing the roots of polarization. This is the third in our series called Building Community Across Divides, Lessons from Near and Far. And many thanks to all of you who have joined from near and far. Uh, and in the spirit of our last series, which was on the Native American presence in the Connecticut River Valley, I want to just begin with a land acknowledgement and acknowledge the land from which we are all tuning in. And from my home in what is called Conway, Massachusetts, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on Nipmuc land. And I'd also like to acknowledge the neighboring indigenous nations, the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohegan and Pequot to the south, and the Mohican and Mohawk to the west, and the Abenaki and Penacooks to the north. So to briefly introduce myself, I'm Polly Byers, and I'm the executive director of the Karuna Center for Peacebuilding, which is an NGO based in Amherst, Massachusetts. And for those of you who may not know, Karuna started over 25 years ago, focused on bridging divides in countries affected by violence, and has worked in over 40 countries since then. This is the third event in this series, which is examining different approaches to building community internationally and in the U.S., looking at what we've learned about techniques and dialogue, mediation, and community-based approaches that Karuna has used over the years and may be useful in healing divides closer to home. We launched the series a few weeks ago with Karuna's founder, Paula Green, uh, and her partner, Ben Fink, talking about their project, Hands Across the Hills, which is a powerful example of the use of dialogue to build relationships and address polarization here in the US. And last week, we heard from partners in Rwanda and Bosnia talking about how dialogue was used in those two countries post-genocide and their different approaches to reconciliation. And this afternoon, I am extremely excited about this discussion on polarization. It's a word that we are hearing and using a lot more these days in the US, um, but often I think without a full understanding about what drives it and how to respond to it. Uh, which is clearly critical in trying to build community and cohesion in any context. And we are very fortunate uh, to have excellent speakers to talk about their work on the issue, specifically focused on Nigeria. And I'm gonna try to briefly introduce them, though it's not easy because they all have a very long list of impressive accomplishments. And I wanna start with Dr. Fatima Akilu, who is the executive director of the Neem Foundation in Nigeria, which is Karuna's incredible partner currently working with us there on a project supporting early warning and early response systems to mitigate farmer herder conflicts, which are a significant cause of violence in the country. Um, and Neem was founded directly in response to the problem of insecurity in Nigeria and focuses on improving the lives of those affected by violence and supporting violent, uh, conflict prevention and peace building, and particularly improving psychological services. And before becoming executive director of Neem, until 2015, Dr. Akilu worked for the Nigerian government developing and pioneering Nigeria's Countering Violent Extremism Program, while serving as the Director for Behavioral Analysis and Strategic Communications at the Office of the National Security Advisor, a position she held for three years. And at Neem, Dr. Akilu heads the psychosocial service component of the foundation, drawing on her 20 years as a trained psychologist. And she's taught and authored research papers relating to mental health issues and has held a number of other senior positions, which I won't relate, but we're very lucky and happy to have her here with us today. Tim Phillips is the founder and CEO of Beyond Conflict, an NGO based in Boston, Massachusetts, um, and also has a way too long and impressive list of accomplishments to do justice to. But to name a few, he's helped catalyze the peace and reconciliation processes in several countries, including Northern Ireland, El Salvador, and South Africa. He's advised the United Nations, the US Department of State, and the Council of Europe, and has been a frequent speaker in national and international forums, including the Council on Foreign Relations, the US Congress, and many others. He's also helped launch and serve on the advisory committee of the Club of Madrid, and has published on transitional justice and conflict resolution and national reconciliation. And lastly, but not last, <laughs> last but not least, Karen Bernstein is the International Peace Building Program Manager for Beyond Conflict, and she leads the Decoding Dehumanization program there. She has 20 years experience working in violent conflict and post-conflict reconstruction context, specifically in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory, Cambodia, Nepal, Ireland, Northern Ireland, and South Sudan, including serving as a civilian UN peacekeeper in Nepal and South Sudan. She's also served as the Middle East Peace Process Advisor to the British Foreign and Commonwealth Office. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to our speakers to hear about their work and research on the psychological and other factors that fuel polarization and different promising approaches to addressing it. And at the end, hopefully reflecting a bit on the lessons that can be drawn from the work in Nigeria on addressing the issues currently affecting the US. So lastly, 
please use the chat box during the talk anytime and we will collect questions and ask them at the end. And um, as I said before, please keep yourselves muted. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Akilu. Thank you so much, uh, Polly and the Karuna Center for uh, inviting me and giving me this opportunity to talk about my work in Nigeria in the context of polarization. Um, I work both in the Northeast, North Central and Northwest of Nigeria. Uh, when I think about polarization and what seems to be happening across um, mainly my country at the moment, there are so many uh, causes and uh, uh, that they're just too numerous to mention. Uh, some of it has to do with structural problems, um, uh, growing youth population, uh, the growing population, uh, governance issues, and um, uh, in a way, technology, uh, technology that's supposed to bring us together is also used to drive us apart, uh, amplifying hate and um, disparate voices. And uh, also the issue of uh, education, the role and the purpose of education. We talk about, uh, a lot of times when we talk about education, we talk about it in terms of access, uh, increase in numbers, uh, enrolling in school, mostly girls, access for girls. But we often don't talk about the content. What is the point and the purpose of uh, education? How can it be used as a tool to bring us together? So this is the context of, in which um, Neem does all this work we try to use psychology as an instrument for peace. We do it in several ways and through several programs. Uh, in the Northeast, we have uh, programs where we do uh, rehabilitation and reintegration of uh, both Boko Haram suspects, uh, Boko Haram returnees, Boko Haram victims. We're perhaps really fortunate in that we have the privilege of, uh, I say privilege because we've learned a lot, of working with the whole gamut of the Boko Haram insurgency. So we've worked with the senior commanders, uh, their wives, their children. We've worked with the people that they've abducted uh, and we've worked with the communities in which they've created a lot of havoc. And through that, uh, we've learned uh, quite a lot of lessons. Uh, some of the lessons that we've learned is um, that uh, in Nigeria currently, there's a debate about um, rehabilitation and reintegration. Uh, it, it, there was a debate in parliament that was uh, against uh, spending so much money on de-radicalization, for example, and reintegrating former Boko Haram members. Um, and we can understand that because we're in the middle of an ongoing conflict, but we also have seen that unless we engage people who are coming out of uh, these kinds of groups, we will just have a continual cycle uh, of, of conflict. And uh, when I talk about trauma, uh, we are now witnessing uh, generational trauma. So we've been experiencing this conflict for about two decades, and we've seen the transfer of trauma from um, parents to children. And um, a lot of the response has not included a psychological response. Uh, so Neem, uh, uh, is very, very clear that this has to be one of the pillars of uh, work in this area. Part of the reason that there hasn't been a concerted psychological response is that we just don't have enough capacity and capability. Uh, we don't have enough mental health practitioners. So uh, for NIM, uh, what we do is we use lay counselors whom we train for nine months. Nine months is a long time to train people, uh, but we train them for one day a week and for four days a week, they're in the field with supervision. And we found that that has enabled us to mount uh, an adequate uh, psychological response for a small number of people. Uh, when you talk about the Northeast, uh, especially Borono State, uh, with a population in the millions, uh, probably 90% are traumatized. So how do you even begin to address the issues of uh, polarization, the issues of what uh, pulls us apart when people cannot even attend to the basic needs because they have so much trauma and they cannot even uh, partake of uh, the humanitarian uh, services that are available to them because uh, of the underlying trauma. So, we, so I feel that um, when we're responding in these areas, the first thing that we must do is address trauma. 
uh, we've developed a module that we think um, can be replicated and used in other parts of, uh, of the world where uh, we provide a set amount of counseling services uh, uh, with a set curriculum and uh, we do it in, in groups and then we form supportive groups for continuity. And we found that uh, through that model, we can reach a lot more people. Uh, in addition to um, providing trauma counseling, rehabilitation of uh, members associated with insurgent groups, we also have a, a big education platform. Uh, we have a school where we bring together uh, children of uh, Boko Haram members, children of civilian JTF who are the vigilante group who fought against Boko Haram, and then children who have just been um, affected by uh, Boko Haram insurgency. So in this school, we have developed a values-based critical thinking curriculum where we also uh, um, actually look at it, a broader understanding of education. I know that in the West, uh, people take for granted lots of things like sports and arts and like, it's not so common, especially in rural areas, in rural schools, people do not have these platforms that allow them to express themselves. So those pathways that people take for granted in other countries to self-actualization is often limited. So we felt it was very important. If you can imagine in some of the areas that we work, something as simple as football, uh, people will tell you that it's forbidden. Uh, so it was. it's important that uh, not only do we work with the children in our school, but we have expanded the school to include the community. So it's also a platform to educate uh, members of the community about the importance of um, children having multiple platforms for self-expression. And in addition to uh, the normal things like sports and art and music that we teach in our school crafts, we also teach them things like tolerance. Uh, kindness, uh, working together, understanding difference, uh, empathy. So these are all now part of the curriculum and it's part, it's embedded within the whole of the school curriculum. So for example, the math teacher also has to teach the same values and, uh, as the civics teacher. Um, we also do have an early warning platform uh, this early warning platform, uh, I think for us, uh, is quite unique because it also has an um, early response system built into it. So uh, it's uh, the community members are part of the early warning network. Uh, it, con it, it consists of every representative of the community. So it will have security sector representation. It will have uh, uh, different levels of traditional leadership, uh, women, and uh, youth groups are all part of this early warning uh, system. And I'll give you, uh, uh, um, and uh, so they meet in a committee uh, form and we give them mobile apps. So people in the community are trained in terms of what to report. We are interested in looking at the very earliest signs of radicalization for this early warning uh, network in the Northeast. Uh, so uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, there was an incident of a woman who had come out of Boko Haram captivity. She had held a leadership role, but she had claimed that she had repented and had been accepted back into the community. Uh, yet uh, she was entertaining a lot of young girls, uh, sometimes uh, in batches of five, 10 at her home. Uh, in very late hours. So this aroused the suspicion of the community who now uh, triggered it on the platform and it went to uh, the committee meeting. It was debated at the meeting and uh, the village head went to her house and also interviewed the young girls and they found out that she was recruiting uh, young women to take them back into uh, Sambisa Forest, which was the headquarters of Boko Haram. Uh, so the early response system now would kick in. So uh, because it now became a security matter, it was escalated to the security services who now came and uh, engaged this, uh, this woman. But we try as much as possible first to have non-punitive community-based responses. We also have uh, a lot of uh, community dialogue, um, a lot of mediation within the communities. Um, we... It, in most of the communities that we work in the Northeast, uh, they have a lot of uh, ex-Boko Haram members who are coming back. Uh, 
So these are communities that have been, some of them raised to the ground by Boko Haram. It's very difficult for them to accept uh, these people coming back. But uh, in Nigeria, thousands and thousands of people either joined Boko Haram or were kidnapped into the movement. So we're talking about huge numbers of people coming back. Uh, therefore, it's necessary to prepare the communities uh, to accept them. And uh, we do that in two ways, by forming groups within the community, by engaging the community, not just in terms of uh, the dialogue of acceptance, but also to understand the issues uh, that exist within the community. So these are issues post-insurgency, uh, during insurgency, and uh, pre-insurgency, so that we really begin to understand at what points we can enter into dialogue and how effective these dialogues are and what the community needs are. Uh, so that allows us to work with them to come up with um, uh, different ways to uh, accept difference, because we have to also understand that when you talk about dialogue with communities, uh, when you're living in an area of conflict, communities have changed. Uh, for example, some of the communities that we worked with uh, 15 years ago, uh, women did not have a voice. Uh, today, in a lot of those communities, women are the primary um, uh, heads of households. Uh, a lot of them uh, have lost uh, husbands uh, and, and uh, fathers and partners. So the role of women has changed, which means the face of these communities have changed. Uh, also, um, the conflict has introduced uh, new problems. For example, uh, in a lot of these communities, we have a lot of problems with drug use amongst youth. This is a new thing that has come as a direct result of conflict. So these are issues that have to be addressed in addition to the dialogue to accept and tolerate uh, people that are coming into the communities anew. Uh, so this is some of the things that we do. In the Northwest, we've had an opportunity to expand uh, directly because of our association and partnership with Corona Foundation. And uh, in the Northwest and the North Central, which, uh, uh, as Polly said in her introduction, is a completely different kind of conflict. Uh, what we have is a, a decades uh, a long uh, farmer herder conflict. Uh, uh, where you have issues based on land. Um, we also have increased banditry. And very, very recently, we're now seeing um, incursions of uh, insurgent groups. Uh, so uh, the early warning, early response uh, system that we use in the North West is flagging completely different issues than it would in the Northeast. But nevertheless, we have a similar mechanism also in terms of the um, early response. Um, in the Northwest, in addition to the work that we're doing with uh, Corona, which also consists of community dialogues, uh, we've seen great improvements in terms of how communities uh, deal with each other, how they deal with difference. Um, in addition to conflict, in, in Nigeria, we have our own uh, long-standing problems uh, to do with pol polarization along uh, ethnic and religious lines. So these uh, have been our fault lines, uh, I think probably for the duration of my lifetime. And uh, these uh, early warning systems allow us to work with them on these kinds of historical issues, but also the newer issues in the community to see how we can uh, uh, better uh, create um, community resilience and harmony. Um, alongside the work that we do with Corona in the Northwest, we have also now started to work uh, with UNICEF on, I, um, I'm sure you've heard about the increased kidnappings of school children. Uh, this has happened uh, in recent weeks uh, in the Northwest. Uh, in one week, I think, in a period of about two weeks, two schools had uh, their young pupils uh, kidnapped. So we have been working to uh, provide uh, trauma services for these children and their families. Um, what happens uh, when um, terrorists and bandits have used this not only as a weapon to divide, but they are also hoping that um, by kidnapping school children, that uh, in, in terms of at least uh, the insurgents, they will achieve their greater aim of um, preventing people from going to school. 
And uh, indeed, what we're seeing is a lot of parents are saying, I don't want to send my child to school anymore if they're going to be kidnapped. And the children are afraid of going back to school. So this, this is devastating because we're looking at um, a generation uh, that will be totally lost uh, without education. Uh, we have also seen the effect of COVID-19 on um, increasing uh, not only polarization, distrust, um, exacerbating existing um, uh, issues, but uh, we have seen a detrimental effect on girls' education. Uh, a lot of parents are pulling their children out of school because uh, COVID-19 has come with such economic hardship that they are marrying off their girls because it's cheaper for them to, to marry off their girls than to uh, uh, allow them to have an education. So this is really the, uh, the environment in which uh, Neem finds herself uh, trying to do work in these different uh, areas to, to bring people together uh, using education, critical thinking, psychology, uh, sports, um, art, uh, music, dialogue, early warning um, to, uh, to, to try and um, hopefully uh, make a difference. So um, thank you very much. Thank you, Fatima. That was an incredible overview of the incredible layers of complexity um you know of the talking about the the different divisions and the and the multi-layered you know ways that you're approaching it um so that was really fascinating to hear so thank you so much for that and for the amazing work um so i think with that tim i'm going to pass it to you correct and then you will be followed by karen Great, <clears throat> thank you. And I wanna thank Fatima for that great uh, introduction. It's uh, a privilege uh, to follow her in her presentation and also thank uh, you, Polly, and uh, the Karuna Center. I've been a big fan for many years, including of Paula's work. So this is really uh, an additional privilege. So um, let me start by giving just a little background on Beyond Conflict and then get to the themes uh, that we're talking about today. So. Beyond Conflict, uh, hard to believe as the founder, will be 30 years old uh, this coming year. And we started at the end of the Cold War in Central and Eastern Europe at the collapse uh, of communism um, to work with these new leaders that were emerging from Central and Eastern Europe uh, with the idea of bringing them together with leaders from other countries that had struggled with the transition from dictatorship to democracy. And then in 1991, 92, we had far fewer examples than we have today. There was Argentina, Chile, other countries in the Southern Cone. There was Spain after Franco, denazification in Germany, uh, Uganda, for example. And uh, the idea from the very beginning was, wouldn't it be interesting to bring together these new leaders of these post-communist countries with people who themselves had struggled with these difficult transitions, um, who had to deal with human rights violations, people who collaborated, you know, uh, this, the, the sort of mindset of either being a victim of having to contract living under repression for a long period of time. And so from that very beginning in 1991-92, we developed this uh, approach of shared human experience, which really was about bringing people together with firsthand experience, often across divides at different levels, to help people sort of navigate change, to imagine change, in a sense to prepare them emotionally psych and psychologically for change. And part of that is to even imagine that you can sit across the table from your, from your enemy, your adversary. And so what began as an, an attempt to help um, a lot of the new leadership in post-communist Europe, of course, I think we all know that there was also at the end of the Cold War, the transitions in Central America, the collapse of Yugoslavia, the end of apartheid in South Africa, the beginning of a peace process in Northern Ireland. So anybody in our sort of field, there was a lot of work to do uh, in the early and mid nineties. And we started growing really uh, with this demand to be able to bring the power of this shared experience. What I often said was like a big support group on wheels 
of people who themselves in their own context would have never imagined they could engage in change um, to improve you know, the status of their community and of their nation. And so that sort of approach of shared experience, we deployed in nearly 75 countries around the world. We all recognize that change is difficult. We know it takes time, um, particularly through contact, but we are always looking in each of these countries for other tools to help people navigate and lead change at different levels from civil society to the sort of uh, top leaders. And we did that through the experience of individuals. Um, and so, you know, in Northern Ireland, we started convening leaders at different uh, levels in Central America. Um, we even helped facilitate some of the first conversations in South Africa that led to the decision to create a Truth and Reconciliation Commission and some of the early work around what became the field of transitional justice, but always sort of ideating. And about a decade ago, we started looking at brain and behavioral science. And I tell the, the, the story, I was teaching a course at the Fletcher School uh, of Law and Diplomacy. And the name of the course was Conflict Transformation in the 21st Century, the Human Dimension. Because my sense was that we were missing some fundamental insights about the nature of conflict. Um, why were there so many intractable conflicts? Why did so many peace agreements uh, remain fragile? Were there really be really durable peace agreements? And every other class that I, I would have a speaker come in, and, and one class I had Jerry Adams come in from Northern Ireland, who some of you may know was the head of Sinn Féin, and though he'll never claim it today, was one of the senior IRA commanders. And a student asked him in the classroom, um, how do you sit across the table from somebody you may have tried to kill, or they may have tried to kill you or killed somebody close to you? And he paused and he said something very powerful. He said, you know, it's tough to make peace with a humiliated partner. And there was a retired neuroscientist sitting in the room. And he came up to me afterwards and he said, you know, there's a lot of brain and behavioral science behind these themes that come up of humiliation, empathy, and fear. And I sort of queried him and said, what do you mean brain science? I knew some of the social psychology literature, what I observed, what I experienced. And he said something so powerful that put me and my colleagues on this journey to learn more from these fields. He said, you know, we are not rational beings with emotions. He said, speaking as a scientist, we're emotionally based beings who can only truly think rationally when we feel that our identities as we see ourselves are understood and valued by others. And at that moment, it also collapsed what we have been doing for close to 20 years of shared human experience, right? I often say we're theory agnostic. We're not the seven steps to yes or follow these steps and you'll get to Nirvana. We were like, how do we keep on looking for a human experience, you know, that can model for others change, positive change, you know, healing change. And at that moment, learning that from him put me on a journey. And one of the benefits being in the Boston area, we had these great universities in labs and started hearing from researchers and scientists, we need to focus more on how we think, not what we think, because how we think is so deeply unconscious. Um, we need to think of the mental models that govern the way we engage in the world or how we think as groups, um, how we think automatically. And I give you this background. So we then went on a journey to engage brain and behavioral science with not only what we learned, but of network of leaders around the world, what they learned. And to see if the sort of combination of science and practice could become more helpful and hopefully more transformative when we think of these profound issues of conflict. And so luckily, um, I was able to form some relationships with MIT and other universities and got some support and funding. And we you know, brought together incredible researchers and practitioners to really challenge each other uh, across these sort of practice and, and research disciplines. And one of the things we started looking at, you know, was how do we apply these insights to what was emerging here in the United States? So around 2015, 2016, with the election, the election of Donald Trump, and seeing the deepening divide going on, I stood back and remember that over the previous decade, a lot of leaders I got to know in countries from South Africa, to Guatemala, to Israel, Palestine, Northern Ireland, the Balkans would say to me, you need to focus on your own country. 
like canaries in a coal mine, they could sense and see the deepening divide happening in the United States. And I would push back and say, yes, I know we have some profound problems, but they say, you don't realize that, you know, we always look to the United States and, you know, knowing it's imperfect, but as a model that people could be in a sense, not all, but a lot of people had a certain degree of sort of citizenship and sovereignty, that you had a bit of a you and I sort of culture politically. And we were stuck in this you, us and versus them sectarian mindsets. And now we see that happening in your country. We see it becoming us versus them, what we had tried to move away from happening in the United States and happening in Britain and happening in other countries around the world. And so we then, as we're building this relationship with scientists, we had colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania and a really close friend and colleague who passed away recently, Emile Bruneau, who I've worked with for the last 10 years based at UPenn, we started doing research on the psychology of polarization in the United States. And what we started looking at, not surprising, was not only is polarization, which is inherent in any democratic system of government, was going from profound disagreement to us versus them. And what the scientists would point out is once it goes to us versus them, a whole range of unconscious psychological processes kick in that serve to drive us further apart. And it, a lot of that sort of happens unconsciously under the hood. And then we started looking through our team at UPenn, our colleagues at UPenn, at the role of misperceptions at a meta level, meta misperceptions, because our brains evolved to be predictive and not reactive. We're constantly predicting our social environment. In a sense, asking the question, what do other people think about me and us? And the more separated we are, the less contact we have, the more we're getting our news from our various social media channels or either Fox or MSNBC, or we don't live next to each other and we, we don't go to the same schools or churches together. We don't play in the same sports. We start constructing a view of the other based on these silos. And what our research found was that bad news is polarization in the United States is becoming in a sense more toxic, like a public health threat because it's increasingly identity-based. But a lot of that, nearly half, is based on misperceptions of the other side. And so one of the things we found in the research, and, and Karen, I don't know if you could pop up that one slide, um, is while that's being put up, we um, looked at big issues like, um, and maybe just the one in the middle, thank you. We started looking at issues like immigration, gun control. Um, we also looked at issues like like and dislike and dehumanization. And if you look at the upper left-hand corner, when you would ask a Democrat, uh, where are you on the issue of open borders and immigration? You would have some strong positions, but there are a lot of people in the middle as the graph shows. When you would ask Republicans where they are in immigration, open borders, you'd get a similar sort of, you know, dynamic. But if you look below on the right, when you would ask the Democrat, where do you think Republicans are on open borders? Their perception was, well, Republicans want them completely closed. And a Republican would say about a Democrat, ah, but they want them completely open. And so on issues from immigration to gun control, to how much you think the other side, how much you dislike the other side and how much you think they dislike you, or even more blatantly on dehumanization, Emil and our colleagues in 13 countries around the world created a blatant dehumanization index, which is a pretty blunt tool, but it's designed because dehumanization is pretty horrible, blunt human behavior, is on the ascent of man scale, where primates all the way to humans, on a scale of one to 100, where would you place these you know, communities like in the Czech Republic, where would you place Czechs? Where would you place Jews? Where would you place Muslims? Where would you place r the Roma? And the question was, how fully evolved do you think they are? And when we did it in the United States, we found that Democrats and Republicans would not put their own community, which is part of being human because you know your own in-group, is not everybody's fully 100%. But they would put the other side up in the mid 80s in terms of how much they think they're fully human or evolved. But when you would ask a Democrat Republican, how much you think the other side dehumanizes you? It was like what we just saw here. It was a nearly half 
overestimated the divides. So we were finding on issues, on like and dislike, and on feelings of dehumanization, that the other side dehumanizes you or dislikes you or is far away at nearly half of what it actually is. And that's a huge per- divide. And what's really interesting from a, let's say a contact conflict resolution perspective, you know, I mentioned earlier when we would work in countries, I think in Northern Ireland, we spent over a decade and 30 to 40 initiatives bringing people across the divides together within Northern Ireland, taking them to other countries and trying to get to those aha moments where they start seeing themselves in the possibilities of change. But what's really interesting about the surveys and the research, if we can correct a lot of the misperception of the other side, if we can begin to rehumanize the other side, if we can begin to see how much people have in common and reduce the threat that compromise presents to reaching across. Oh, I can't reach across because I'd be attacked by my community. I'd be selling out. If we can correct that ahead of time by doing these surveys, then there's a really good possibility that contact when it happens is much more successful because there's less at, there's less at risk when you bring people in contact. And that's one of the things we wanna look into. But in this, in this research, we found that we do have this divided mind and this perception, we do have real divides, but not as bad as people think. And so what we're doing right now is with colleagues at UPenn and elsewhere, we're actually creating and testing interventions including videos, and where we're filming re- Democrats and Republicans and asking them similar questions and seeing even today that average Democrats and Republicans will say, yeah, we're much further apart. They dislike me. They dehumanize me. As you can imagine after what's happened this past year. And then when they see the research, they literally sit back and say, wow. And what's literally happening is a cognitive shift. And there is evidence You know, uh, there's a colleague, Mina Chakira at Harvard, who's a social psychologist doing work in this area. And she found that just correcting these misperceptions creates a cognitive shift where warmth to the other side increases and cooperation, willingness to cooperate increases. So I give you this um, as a bit of a background on some of the work. And and Karen, if you want to um, take that down, but and that's a report, America's Divided Mind, that's on our on our website. But as we think about polarization, we're trying to address a real world issue. We're bringing insights from leaders around the world at different levels, but also what brain and behavioral science can offer us. And let me share a couple of things that more sort of empirically that we're trying to share um, from leaders around the world is many of them sit back and even those from liberation movements are very concerned, not only by the deepening divide in this country, but also the language coming not only from the right, but the left. And I go back to what Mandela, who used to be on our advisory board and one of the great honors, when we would bring people from Northern Ireland or other countries to see him in South Africa, he would say, say, be tough on structures and institutions, but not on each other. And there's an incredible moment when he was coming out of prison in 1990 and a speechwriter gave him a draft of the first speech he gave to the world. And when he met in private with Mandela, there were all these handwritten corrections and Mandela had written, F.W. de Klerk is an honorable man. Now this is Mandela coming out of prison and de Klerk, as you remember, was his imprisoner. And the speechwriter said, Madiba, which is what they called him, you can't say that. Your people have struggled, they have suffered, you've spent nearly three decades in prison. How could you call him an honorable man? And in the privacy of their room, Mandela reached across and said, It is up to him to disprove it. And in that moment of wisdom and leadership and courage was how do I build a bridge? How do I use whatever moral and political authority that I have or other people less famous than me have to allow people to change, to imagine that they too can change? That if we want to change systems and structure, they require a degree of human agency. And that requires that we also believe in the human capacity for change. And so, you know, we're looking to bring not only these insights from brain and behavioral science to issues like polarization, we're also looking to say, how do we take this collective knowledge of people who would say, if you want to deal with your past, which you have to deal with, you need a shared understanding of the past, but also in service of a shared vision of the future. 
And, you know, I, I, I recently wrote a piece in the Boston Globe magazine about this big debate about Joe Biden calling for unity and getting pushback. And I thought it was important to point out the difference between unity and clarity. That, you know, you can think in peace agreements like in Dayton Peace Accords or Good Friday, when you're trying to get a political resolution to a violent conflict, there needs to be a certain degree of consensus and agreement and unity to sign that agreement to stop the violence and at least, you know, in an acute way, deal with that problem. But often they miss clarity. What was the per what was the source of this conflict in the first place? How did we get here? How do we have some shared understanding of what drove us to this place? Because if we don't have that, then how do we develop a shared vision of the future? And so when we look at deepening polarization in this country, leaders will say, avoid binaries of the us versus them. Don't even use the word your enemy, use the word adversary. Be clear that it's not unity for as compromise, but clarity as a way of both sides coming to be clear about what is the nature of the problem and how do you come together to figure a way forward. And so that's been how we've been looking at this issue is not only having some real research behind it, but also this sort of practical input and in, in experience and insights. Now, COVID has made it difficult. We were planning <laughs> a bit of programming around the country and in Washington with a lot of these leaders. And we've been trying to do it, but hopefully soon we'll be able to do it in, in person. And the other quick thing I want to mention, and, and Karen will go into it more, is the work on dehumanization. As we started working with brain and behavioral scientists, we also started looking at the issue of dehumanization and particularly the psychology of it. And so we launched this initiative four years ago on decoding dehumanization, which is how do we unpack what we know from brain and behavioral science, what political science tells us and what others tell us about dehumanization. And one of the funders who gave us this money you know, we're supporting a lot of work on mass atrocities, you know, sort of gross human rights violations. And they were sitting back saying, the challenge we saw, if you were a funder or government trying to deal with these mass atrocities, um, what are your options? We have these human rights covenants and agreements, but a lot of them don't carry the day. There is economic sanctions, but they don't often work. There are military solutions, but those are very difficult. President Obama did not go into Syria. Who is going to engage on the Rohingya crisis in Myanmar? You can go down the list. So what's left? And so the notion was, if we could understand how dehumanization occurs as a psychological process of those mechanisms, could we better understand how to recognize it when it's coming in language? And then what do we do about it when it happens? And, and with that research, we released a report um, two years ago on decoding dehumanization. And part of it, we're now testing and designing interventions, which Karen will talk about um, uh, in a moment, that we're, we're testing. But the other thing I'll mention is, and something Fatima said about trauma and about um, learning about our brains. One of the things as a non-scientist that I really feel strongly about is, and I sort of jokingly said to my therapist a few years ago, I want to rebate learning more about how the brain works has advanced my understanding of myself and others around me. There's something very agency enabling to learn about how our brains work in the world. And what we have found, whether working with Syrian refugees uh, in Zatri uh, camp in Jordan and developing a field guide for barefoot psychology or working on dehumanization or working on polarization, when people learn about their brains, uh, they feel empowered and liberated because they feel like, well, I'm not crazy. I'm not stupid. Other humans would feel the same way under similar circumstances. So there's a certain uh, agency being enabled to be able to think about yourself in the world. And, and that's a big part of what we're doing is also just giving people the tools to understand themselves, understand how our brains work, and then develop programming from that. So I won't spend too much time or hopefully bore you too much, but I wanted to um, transition to uh, my colleague, um, Karen, and happy to answer questions uh, going forward. And thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I don't think you have to worry about boring anybody. It's just fascinating. I mean, I'm, 
<laughs> so people have already said, are you just being recorded? Yes, it is. So anyway, so I'm going to, so thank you. That was an incredibly uh, just powerful overview of how the work evolved, all of that. It was just, it was fabulous. Um, okay, Karen, over to you. <clears throat> Sorry, it's hard. <clears throat> Sorry, it's hard to follow Tim on that. That was, I, I can't remember ever hearing it in full. And um, wow, I'm glad I work for Beyond Conflict. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, I just have a frog in my throat, apologies. So I'm just gonna follow Tim up with just telling you a little bit of our, our Nigeria project. And I actually um, prepared a little bit of a um, slides for you so you can get the visuals because that I, I always find that they're um, helpful to understand the scenario. So let me just do that. Um, and as I, as I pull it up, I'll just tell you a little bit, um, as Tim mentioned, that Beyond Conflict had been doing um, research through with our scientific partners at UPenn. Um, and, uh, he, Tim had mentioned Emile Bruneau. Um, and, and Tim um, and, and others had gone and spoken to practitioners and policymakers around the world who were working on genocide and, policy, and violence prevention. And so from all of those conversations and the research that Emile and others were doing, we knew that the humanization um, that we, we define as the perception of other people as less than human. We knew that it was important to the study of conflict um, because it was nearly always present in situations of group targeted harm, um, like systemic discrimination and like mass atrocities. Um, and we also knew from, from under knowing history that, that the humanization helps to promote um, moral disengagement that often leads to atrocities. Uh, and if you ever looked at photos from history, um, you've seen that it's full of examples of dehumanization in situations of, of mass atrocities, like, um, like the reference of cockroaches to refer to the Tutsis in Rwanda um, right before the genocide of Jews as rats. Um, and in these contexts and others, we, um, you, you're probably also familiar with the fact that influential elites have often used dehumanization itself to normalize violence and, and discrimination against, against the outgroup, against a group of people. And this basically comes from the fact that if, if that group of, if, if you as part of the in-group don't see them as human, then it's easier to justify these acts against them. So let me just share my screen now and I can show you a little bit more. Uh, okay. So Tim mentioned um, that we had done this, this, that our scientific partners and Beyond Conflict had done this research around the world. And in fact, um, um, a few years ago, that research was conducted in, in 12 countries with over 10,000 people. Um, and we found that blatant dehumanization, which is uh, dehumanization done in really obvious, non-subtle ways, that, that it was one of the strongest predictors of intergroup hostility in every one of the countries it was surveyed. And in fact, it even predicted uh, attitudes and policy support related to uh, targeting civilians, related to support for war, and related to um, support for collective punishment. So now once we understood um, the importance of dehumanization played in creating support for violence between conflicting groups, we started to investigate how we could both identify the humanization taking place and how we can reduce it in intergroup conflict scenarios. Um, and so we chose Nigeria for, for several reasons. When we were already collaborating with local peace builders who had asked us to come to Nigeria and identify whether dehumanization was taking place and how we could stop it. Um, it was also around the time where violence started, where broke out in, in the middle belt as, as Fatima had explained. Um, predominantly between predominantly Muslim herders and predominantly Christian farmers, and that had escalated um, to unprecedented levels and killed 1,500 people that year. And Nigeria was also listed as one of the top 10 uh, countries to watch for mass atrocities or, or for mass violence on several watch lists, including the U.S. Holocaust Museum and the International Crisis Group. And it was just around the time of the election 2019. And we noted the political elites were actually going on social media and using inflammatory identity-based language to, for their own political ends um, to stoke divisions. So Nigeria just seemed like a natural site for our pilot. So what we did um, in June of 2019 was along with our Nigerian partner, uh, Peace Initiatives Network, 
um, was organize and facilitate a workshop with about 25 local peace builders, media professionals and researchers from all around Nigeria. And we talked about our research findings um, and then we facilitated a process together in which concluded in the design of our very first um, dehumanization detection tool. And this was, um, it took the form of a survey, as Tim mentioned, a survey instrument, and it included a scale measurement, um, the ascent of scale, ascent of man scale that Tim described, and um, also a series of trait words like associating the group, one group as being brutal or primitive, um, as being irrational, and that all of these, um, both in this survey instrument, which included this measurement scale, as well as these trait words, helped us to identify, in fact, if this humanization was taking place. So um, after we created the survey tool, we and our local partners, we created a radio program um, that uh, hit both kind of certain theoretical notes that came from social and behavioral science, but also allowed us to, to have a natural storyline that was based on, on, the local, on the local culture. And what we found was that the, the radio program intervention was also inspired. Um, um, we specifically wanted it to be inspired by the social psychology theory of vicarious contact. And this theory um, hypo hypothesizes that by observing fellow in-group members, even fictional ones on radio or TV, um, by, versi by observing them interacting positively with out-group members, that it can improve the in-group members' attitude um, towards the out group. And then we hope that on this basis, that those that were listening to the radio program in our pilot, that they would, it would also lead to a reduction in dehumanization and threat perception. So that's, that's what we had um, assumed, we had hoped um, based on what that theory told us should happen. And so we tested whether or not it was impactful uh, with a randomized control trial that um, we conducted with about 2,600 Muslims and Christians. And the participants who took part in the survey, they heard one of the following three radio programs that you see on your screen there. The first was, was what we created, the, the treatment radio program. And this was the story of a Christian man and a Muslim man who are assigned to be partners at work. And at first they're very wary of each other, um, but over time they start to learn they have a lot in common and they become good friends. Um, there was the other option that the listener could have heard was what we call the, the control program, which was similar, but it focused on two members of the same religion that learned that basically their first impressions of each other were, were wrong. Um, and the third option was basically the pure control program um, or the, the placebo program, which basically contained messages about maintaining self-health practices. And so after the radio program, like, like if you could see from these pictures, we had interviewers, um, women who, who interviewed other women, men who interviewed men, um, divided on, on the basis of religion as well to make sure that the respondents were comfortable. And they went and asked the respondents a series of questions about their interreligious attitudes and animosity um, that included questions on the humanization, um, included questions on threat perceptions and endorsement of neg negative traits. Um, and as well as support for interreligious violence. And we tested this intervention in Kaduna in the middle basin of Nigeria. That's where you could see the map on, on the left hand of the screen. And we chose Kaduna because of its historical legacy um, as, as the biggest, as one, if not the biggest hotspot for interreligious violence in Nigeria over the last two decades. And, and I can tell you from personal experience of being there, that when you're in Kaduna, the tension is palpable. And in fact, our research field could coordinator Mohamed Bukhar, who comes from the Northwest region of Nigeria, said that he had never felt tension um, gr greater in, than in Kaduna than in any other place he'd been in Nigeria. And, so, and as you can see from the different colors on the map that's associated with kind of um, uh, Christians and Muslims, that the city is, div is, is deeply divided and the Christians live in the South and the Muslims live in the North, um, divided by a bridge. And, and there are stories of, of, of people who had never crossed that bridge. Um, so what do we find out? What we found out from these statistics, as you can see here, is that people are highly uh, traumatized. They've, many have either witnessed or experienced violence in their community. But we also found that there were a high level of, um, of dehumanization and, and perceptions of threat that were taking place between Christians and Muslims. Um, at the same time, we also found that Christians and Muslims were willing to interact with each other. And they said a lot of positive things about each other. 
And so when we looked at how people um, answered the survey in the, in the end line, we found in, in, and compared it to, um, to the baseline survey, what we found is that by listening to, to, the, to the contact, to the treatment program that we created, the vicarious contact radio program, that it effectively reduced support for interreligious violence between Christians and Muslims, and that it, it reduced interreligious animosity. Um, and this included reducing blatant dehumanization, but also perceptions of how threatening um, the other religious group was, uh, endorsement of negative traits about, about the groups, like that the other group is violent or immoral or, or fanatical, as well as um, support for interreligious violence. So, we got quite excited about this. And on the basis um, of the successful messaging program, we, we designed uh, a similar storyline that cut across a full season of the Nigerian tel television station, Aririk 24. Um, it's a award winning drama series, which is called Dadan Koa. And Dadan Koa um, itself reaches a viewership of about 40 million people. It's, it's their primetime show and, um, and, and extremely popular. And so we worked with the screenwriters and, and um, that's um, Rebecca Littman, Dr. Rebecca Littman, who's the researcher and myself meeting with the screenwriters there in that picture. And we met with them and, um, and followed up with them for months to come up with a natural storyline again that, that hit those same theoretical notes. Um, so this time we found that there was even a greater reduction of the perceptions of the other group um, uh, as a threat and also a reduction in associating them with negative traits. And, and we found that those who watch the TV drama were also more willing to interact across the, 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 the religious line divide, like, like um, and, and that they ended uh, more like, they were more likely to like the other religion more and more likely to actually interact with someone from the other religion over the past month. Um, and we were very excited about this because what we were, were what we found is that People who had been exposed to the TV drama, um, this was not just a, a, a 10 minute um, radio program that we had exposed them to. This was over a, a whole season um, for a few months. And so um, this, these are the results that came out four to eight weeks after, after the show aired, the last episode of the show. So um, we, we were, were excited to know what we'll be able to do with such results. So lastly, I just want to tell you a little bit about um, the last, the, the, the other um, activity that we're currently doing, which is recently we trained a group of 100 heads of peace building NGOs across Nigeria um, on our key research insights. And we trained them also on how to use media to address the human uh, dehumanizing rhetoric in their communities. And on May 16th, which is the International Day of Living Together in Peace, um, beyond conflict in our local partner peace initiatives network, we're going to be launching a, a social media campaign to spread awareness about dangerous speech with, with the active participation of these peace builders. And the campaign will be focused on how dangerous speech, which is speech basically used to dehumanize a whole group of people, how um, dangerous key speech can help to normalize violence and discrimination against a group of people. And our we have three objectives. One is to inform the public um, of the dire consequences of the humanization and dangerous speech in, in order to reduce their susceptibility uh, to such rhetoric. Um, we want to be able to create a firewall of community leaders who are committed to avoid, to prevent, and, and to stop dangerous speech because they fully understand how it can lead to violence. And lastly, we want to share that knowledge on how it's possible to rehumanize the other side in ways that we found work. Uh, through that radio and television interventions I mentioned to you. And as part of that campaign, we'll be, we'll be sharing a public pledge um, to reject dangerous speech. And we welcome all of you to sign that pledge and to follow our campaign. And if you'd like to learn more, please follow our Facebook page, the Beyond Conflict Facebook page, and uh, we'll keep you in touch about that. With that, I will end there. Thank you very much. That is great. Um, I can't thank you, the three of you, enough. I mean, those were like uh, just really fabulous presentations and incredibly fascinating work. Um, so I, I, um, I mean, I have a lot of questions, but I would encourage, um, I mean, everybody's been so glued to listening to you that we haven't gotten a lot of questions yet, but please, um, we have a lot of praise and it, it was excellent. 
Um, but please, um, all of you who are on, feel free to um, type in any questions or we can call on you and uh, ask. But um, I might just start off with um, just actually going back to, um, oh, well, all right. Mickey, do you have your hand up? If you do, I will call on you. <laughs> I do, but absolutely, Polly. I know better than to follow you. So please no, no, go ahead. Okay. Well, here's, I have a quick question and then you can come next. Mickey, by the way, was on, I mentioned at the beginning that our, the last week we had people, including Mickey, uh, for talking about our experience and work in Bosnia and in Rwanda. But I was going back, I mean, there's, there's so many things to ask you, but going back to Fatima talking about working with people coming out of Boko Haram and the work that needs to be done, you know, in community with preparing communities when communities have been raised and it's been devastating. Um, and then also those people, those individuals who were coming back, whether they'd been abductees or um, people who joined them. But I'm wondering, because it, it reminds me, you know, of some of the approaches that the, the Karuna has used of the importance of, you know, there's, you can do reconciliation and, you know, getting people to, you know, through dialogue, there's all these different levels and ways of doing and approaching it, but of, of getting people engaged in activities, of actually engaging them in some way. And I'm just wondering um, to all of you, but you know, Fatima, I mean, I'm based particularly on the, the work that you all are doing with Boko Haram, and may, Tim, Karen, you may have thoughts on that. But you know, sort of examples of where you're seeing that, how that is being done successfully, um, or or the challenges therein. But it seems obviously that's a crucial role. You've got people coming back and unless there is something for them to go back to, but they're going back to these communities where, you know, they've, uh, <laughs> you know, a, a huge challenges, um, you know, how ways of sort of managing that. So uh, I thank need you. Okay, thank you for your question, Polly. Um, it's really, really complex because people who come back, come back with all sorts of issues. One is uh, a lot of the young women who have been abducted are coming back either pregnant or with babies. Uh, mm -hmm. So you, they're coming back to communities that have uh, probably have changed, one. And number two, uh, a lot of the community members, including their fathers and probably brothers and uncles, um, accept the girls often, but not the baby. Uh, so that brings a whole layer of uh, a complexity because uh, there's a lot of fear. Um, a, a lot of people uh, fear that uh, the children will have the DNA of the terrorist. And um, so they don't want them in their community. There's also issues of stigmatization. Uh, a lot of people who have been associated even when they're victims with insurgents uh, stigmatized when they come back into the communities. Uh, we have found uh, entry points for us in Nigeria has been community leaders, uh, religious leaders uh, who have been, who have the moral authority within that community to actually talk to uh, members of their community to get them to accept, to forgive, uh, so we come in on the back of that. Uh, when you come in at the front end, it's very, very difficult because we're not from that community. Uh, so uh, working with uh, religious leaders, community leaders uh, has been um, has been key for, for us. And then the dialogue comes in after that um, with the NGOs. Thank you. I, Tim, Karen, I don't know if you want to add anything from, from your experience or? Um, I wish my colleague, Mike Nickenshuk was here because he's been doing a lot of work with um, not just Syrian refugees, but people who were involved in combat, people who were tortured, people who were imprisoned. Um, and the only thing I would add is what he reinforces to me and others is that we have to be very careful not to use phrases like trauma as if everybody who's been through the same experience is traumatized the same way or that experience shapes what who they are and what they do it's like the word empathy is way overused um you know if you look at it from a research point of view you know empathy is contingent on context to a point of view and proximity right as a, as, as how our brain engages with the experience of others but i think what fatima said 
is a huge illustration of the problems. And, but, you know, when we think of reintegration, think of it in this context. If you were a member of a right-wing militia or the Proud Boys or any of these organizations and, you know, didn't go through what, for example, what Fatima talked about in terms of what these women and others, but too often people sort of collapse these words of reintegration and coming back into the community as one size fits all. And I don't think anybody in this phone of uh, this call would do that, but it's surprising and shocking to see in this discourse how people then lump these together and then it becomes difficult to have a conversation because people think, well, are you talking about this group of people? And I think we have to be really precise about what are the particular challenges we're facing in different context for different experiences. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally, totally right. I think the, it's the easy thing is to lump, right? They're from that group, they're whatever. We just, you know, we, without any of the understanding the nuance of the context or the issues. And so then the responses aren't obviously effective. So thank you both. All right, I'm gonna to go to Mickey and then Jennifer, I'll ask your question. Mickey, over to you. Great, thank you. And wonderful to see you, Tim, after a couple of decades, but always a huge fan of your work. And Salam Fatima, what an inspiration. So I had thank questions you. for you both, even though Karen, you also rock the ball. Thank you so much. But so first, Fatima, for you, having also journeyed along these lines, what often happens is that for many of people, the act of radicalization comes of their lived experience of being touched by security sector. So maybe they're religiously or ideologically leaning to, et cetera, and then it happens. The police comes, their father is arrested, they go to the jails, et cetera, and we've seen that even in Palestine, but certainly in the Nigerian context. And yet, and this is more, but even the example you shared, but I've certainly seen it firsthand in my work in Pakistan and Afghanistan, these issues. Even when we have fabulous initiatives like yours, when the community, both the wonderful warning systems as well as the response, discovers such a potential of radicalization, we also then turn to security sector as the source of a solution. And even in your example, you said we had to escalate to the security sector. So how do we break that vicious circle? Because in my sad experience, the reality, including in the United States, with the policing experience is that is the most broken part of the human institutions that, that we are dealing with. And Tim, for you, just like that was so terrific. I mean, I, I feel energized even without my Bosnian coffee at 5 p.m. What you touched upon is so like clear and it's obvious. And I do wanna thank you, particularly as a survivor of a war myself and then married to Guatemala and journeyed with Karuna for 30 years. Most of us really appreciate this approach because it actually proves scientifically, we're not crazy. What happened to us is crazy. But all of these countries and these societies are not traumatized in a way that psychological interventions require. Therefore, we need the work of beyond conflict and corona. And yet my challenge remains having, thanks to Paula Green and others, myself 30 years being rescued by the aha moment you mentioned. I, I love that because it's so true for so many of us doing this work, we can recall so many moments of people's eyes opening, their hearts melting and saying, this is what I craved, even in the middle of a genocide. So we have tons of those. And yet when we seem to continue to fail, and I do this after 40 years, I'll keep at it, like Paula has for all her life, and Olivia and Polly now. But what I still am puzzled by is this, how do we make it institutional? How do we make it systemic? And how do we indeed go beyond these wonderful experiences where we know polarization in the US is, as you described, a lot of it can be done. And hopefully, Karuna can contribute even in the US. Yet what we see day in and day out from Fox News to MSNBC, and thank you for being critical of the left, is the perpetuation of the, that second graph. And nothing institutional, to be honest, in most of the left, the circle, they, they're cynical about Biden. They want to laugh him out of town. And so I'm concerned the U.S. is not looking for institutional ways, approaches, and really systemic uh, very, v validation of your point. It's not as bad as it seems. Well, Mickey, thank you. And, um, and thank you for everything you've done. And um, so a, a couple of thoughts. 
after 30 years as an American working overseas, there are days when I feel that all of that was in preparation to bring it home to the United States. Um, and I, I, do, I do really stress and get anxious about what I see developing here among as much on the left as the right and others falling into the same trap that we witness in other countries of people thinking they have the answers. And when you, when you think of um, living under Milosevic or living under the Bosnian war or living in Northern Ireland or living in Guatemala under Rio Smont and others, you can go on and on and on. And you think about that and the, the toxicity of those environments push people away from each other it, it, and and they become more outraged, more anxious, more fearful, where grievance and legitimate grievance and legitimate loss and fear come on and take on a much more a deeper emotional emotional resonance. And we've seen a hint of that after four years of Donald Trump, particularly for people who opposed Donald Trump, but even people who supported him when they saw the reaction to him, right? And so for so many people, I mean, I think of myself as an old fashioned liberal, but now I wonder, you know, it, it, I, I, in the sense, not, not a liberal, but in the sense of, I see people making the mistakes that we would advise people in other countries not to make. Don't put people into these binaries. Don't follow and fight for structural and systemic change and not believe in the capacity for humans to change. Um, yes, we need to be clear about the challenges we face. Yes, we do need clarity. But we also have to ask, what is our North Star? Are we, do we want a democracy? Is, is it gonna be truly a more representative, inclusive democracy? We need to keep our eye on some prize, right? In that sense. And then the other is, you know, to recognize that um, this is a moment when the United States can learn and must learn from all the experiences we've heard from people around the world and what we've seen in other countries. Because we're at a moment where it's not only deeply destructive the path we're on as a country, but the impact globally is quite large. I've had friends in many other countries saying, you know, things could go really bad here in X, Y, and Z country, but they won't have as much a global impact as your country going off the tracks. And so, you know, to the point about the news networks, structural racism is real, and so is in structural polarization. You know, one way we're trying to address that issue um, is at scale. So we're working with a re researchers at Harvard University, and for the last two years, we were able to get some seed money, developed an epistemic quiz game where they've gone with real conservatives and liberals out in the United States, playing a game on a gaming platform, but it was designed where liberals and conservatives knew where the other was coming from politically, but it was built on cooperation but a certain type of cooperation in a sense saying the first question that the, the Democrat Republic, uh, and conservative, I mean, the liberal and conservative would be asked is name the cast of duck dynasty, name the cast of stranger things. And we knew that liberals tend to know more of the cast of stranger things and conservatives knew more of the cast of uh, duck dynasty. And so when the question came, and they would have won like $20 just getting that answer, the liberal would say, well, I do know the cast of Stranger Things. And they would sort of virtually high five each other. And the conservatives say, and I know the cast of Duck Dynasty in high five. And what we found in the surveys before doing this research is that conservatives tended to have higher warmth to liberals than liberals to conservatives in the United States. And after playing this game for one hour, where it got increasingly a little bit more difficult, but built on cooperation, four months later from a one hour game, warmth to the other side, willingness to cooperate with the other side remained high, it declined, but it remained higher for conservatives to liberals than liberals to conservatives. And the hypothesis 
and all my colleagues are doing this uh, very much on the liberal progressive side, and we've seen this in other data, is that when we hear that people in this country feel like they're treated with contempt, they're looked down upon. And when they're not treated that way, when their cultural knowledge and fluency is rewarded and not stigmatized, their willingness to engage and feel warmth to the other side increases. And so what I tell you this story, and it's still further research being done, is if we can scale that, because millions, tens of millions of people play games, and we think of it as a response to the Russian troll farms. So what do these troll farms do by the Russians and many others are, is they constantly put out this, these um, polarizing narratives through social media and so forth. Because we live in a cognitive ecosystem, they may have a shelf life of a week or two days. But if you're constantly getting it, getting it, it keeps on reinforcing these norms and narratives and ways of thinking and behaving. Well, what if we can find a suite of these interventions that can go to scale and create new ones putting out there? What it's doing is inoculating or reinforcing a, degree, a willingness to, to cooperate, to see the other side as human because they respect you and treat you with respect for who you are and what you bring to the table. And I think when it comes to these issues of structural polarization, I mean, one of the worst things that could happen to UK as bad as things are with Brexit is Fox News setting up shop, which they're trying to do. So I don't have an easy answer, but I think it's incumbent upon all of us to say, how do we have real evidence of what you know, we know it a lot empirically and anecdotally, but now if we have real data behind it and we understand these psychological processes, people do want to be treated with respect. And that, and, and then seeing that is, I think, really important. But the, tr the, the challenge is going to be how do you get it out there at scale constantly? Yeah, huge question, huge issue. And I mean, at least there's, you know, there's, you know, there's promising stuff that you guys are finding out. It's just, it's, it's how, how do you do it? Um, I want to give, I, we're running out of time, Fatima, um, a, a chance to respond to Mickey's, the first question about the security sector, you know, and people being pushed into radicalization, um, but also them being the, the ones on the other end of when people are coming back. So I'll let you respond to that. All right. Thank you, Mickey, for your question. <laughs> it's really tough. Um, in Nigeria, as you rightly said, uh, one of the main drivers of radicalization actually is the way that the security sector have behaved. Um, I mean, the the whole Boko Haram uh, insurrection really blew up as a result of a clash with security services very early on in 2004. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they are also part of the solution. They've got to be. Uh, there's a limit to what uh, civil society can do. Uh, one of the things that we tried to do in Nigeria was to form a, a security sector civil society network. Uh, it was called PAVE. Uh, um, and we brought together a lot of the leading uh, NGOs at the time uh, who were working in conflict and also the Office of the National Security uh, Advisor uh, to dialogue, to create this platform where they can collaborate and, and work together. There are certain things, uh, I mean, because I've worked in government uh, on this same issue and I've, I'm now working out of government. I've realized that government cannot do it by themselves and I've realized uh, civil society cannot. So we actually need each other. Uh, for example, there are things that require a security sector intervention. Uh, 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 in terms of security stability of the country, you have to work with them. Uh, but I think uh, the, sec the security sector needs just as much uh, education, capacity building, uh, knowledge and understanding as on the other side. And they also are in need of the same dialogue that we do within communities. We have to do that with, um, uh, with the security sector. And just to end, I'd like to say, Tim, uh, thank you so much for reminding us of the issue of trauma and how complicated it is. And because now we're talking a lot about trauma and mental health and we often lump it in, in one basket and you're so right that it's different in different contexts and for different people and that we should be reminded of that. So thank you. Yeah, and Fatima, that's where you started with, I mean, that was when I sort of had well, I won't ask another question about, but that's where you started actually about talking about trauma and how, you know, the work that you're doing on, on, you know, recognizing how important it is and how, you know, problematic if it is not addressed. I mean, that it's, 
Um, so that's you know the work that you're doing as well. Uh, let me quickly, I feel bad we are running out of time. Um, I feel bad Jennifer um, asked a question um, a ways back to say, what have you found as a strategy for reducing the sense of humiliation that one or more sides in a conflict um, might experience to any of you to respond? Mm. Um, you know, a few years ago, when eight years ago, when uh, Emil Bruno and I, when he was at MIT, we did this first conference at the Media Lab on neuroscience and social conflict. And then we were looking to do the second conference. And I said, can we focus it on the issue of humiliation? What do we know about the neurobiology of humiliation, about the psychological process, the neural mechanisms? We certainly know it from experience. And it turns out there was virtually no research on how we process humiliation in our brains. And there was, though, on dehumanization. So, for example, there's research that suggests that we process disgust differently in the brain than fear. So I use the analogy, particularly this is pre-COVID, but if you're on, I'm sorry to be disgusting, but we're talking about disgust. If you're on a plane and you're in the aisle seat and somebody walks all these people walking on the plane and somebody sneezes all over you, what is your response? But one of disgust. It's, it's a pathogen threat. It is a threat to your very existence at this micro, microbial level. And you want to push that and eradicate that threat. Whereas if a bully from your high school days, and I had a whole bunch of them came on the plane, you would put your head down, you look the other way and hope they don't see you. And that's a fair response. So they get processed differently in the brain. And so the notion was that understanding, you know, are we dealing with a, not only a dehumanization, but is it a disgust generated response to eradication, ethnic cleansing and genocide, or is it more driven by fear, could lead to different interventions. And we funded two years ago through a donor, this political scientist, Marika Landau-Wells, who is now at Berkeley and is a political scientist working on neuroimaging, and she looked at learning neuroimaging on transgender bathroom use. And if you're having a disgust or fear response to people from people and seeing the neural correlates of that. And then if we could, and she's finishing the research that could suggest different interventions. So to your question about humiliation, we focus on dehumanization because it was existing research. And then we and our partners did others. But I mean, one thing I would say is that, you know, we have, as one of my colleagues who's a scientist said, we have a biological necessity to feel understood. And humiliation is not only related to shame, but feeling judged in certain ways, not understood as you see yourself, not understood as you see your experience that leads you to a certain emotional or other state. And I think it would be a real contribution to convene and sort of deconstruct humiliation the way we deconstruct issues like dehumanization or as we even think about empathy. And there's, you know, there's research on empathy and how it gets processed in the brain. And I think that that's, I, I wish I had a clearer answer. It's certainly one of the big drivers of our human experience. We know it when we experience it, but we need to understand it more. Okay, I feel like we could ask you a lot more questions, um, but out of respect for your time, um, that we should let you go. Um, I honestly, this has been a fascinating, yep, Mickey's clapping, we're all clapping. I mean, it's been, fa I mean, the work is fascinating um, and incredibly impressive. And um, we look forward to learning more. Um, and I think there is so much to learn, I mean, obviously, Tim and Karen, I mean, you're doing work in the US, you've done work all over, but the work both in Nigeria, I mean, there is so much, I think that we can learn um, here in the US, I mean, it is, but, it's, but it's big, as Mickey says, I mean, you have these nice little examples of a community doing good work. You have Paula Green, you know, with the bringing people from Lever to Kentucky, like, you know, there are these great little examples of things happening of people getting to, to rehumanize each other, but you know, how do you, do that. So I think some of the work, the research you're doing on finding ways, whether it's games and you know, using social media for good, I feel like, man, it's so, 
you know, that's it's such a volatile, you know, uh, communication sphere. I mean, there's so much that can be used for ill or for good. But um, anyway, so I hate to cut it off, um, but I honestly cannot thank Fatima, Tim, and Karen enough for your work, for your time, and for all of you who were able to be here today. Um, it was just fascinating. So huge thanks to you all. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.